My name is Roy Clarkson, I'm an engineer on the Spring Cloud Services team. I'm Oli Hughes, I'm also an engineer on the Spring Cloud Services team. Um, it's also my first ever talk, so please go easy on me. <laughs> Uh, disclaimer, I don't really have any, uh, this mic is not, sorry. Guys, can you help us on the mic? It's kind of... Okay, yeah. Uh, disclaimer, you probably went on want, going to want to use SCS after the end of this talk. At least that's our hope. Um, safe Harbor, we're going to be talking about a few forward-looking things here. Uh, what's coming next and uh, next versions of SCS. And here's our outline. We're going to do an overview of SES as it currently stands, um, talk about the individual services, talk about uh, the dependencies for building a client application with SES, um, CLI plugin, what's new in the version 2.0 that came out this summer, and then I'm going to hand off to Ali. He's going to do uh, what's coming next in SES 3 and give some demos. So. Uh, overview of Spring Cloud Services. Um, you've probably heard of microservice architecture. Maybe you've started working, building microservices. Um, maybe you had one app and then it grew to two or three, maybe four, and now you've got like 40 apps. How do all these things tie together? Uh, maybe you've got like this diagram, arrows going all over the place. Uh, how can Spring Cloud Services help you with this? Well, there's a few design patterns that uh, seem to be really beneficial for building microservices architectures. Uh, external configuration, circuit breaker, and service registry are the three that we're gonna address today. And coincidentally, we have three services within Spring Cloud Services that correspond to each of those. We have a config server service, circuit breaker dashboard, and a service registry. And I'll explain a little more about each of those as I get into the sections. Uh, what's the difference then between what Spring Cloud Open Source offers versus what Spring Cloud Services offers as a tile on the platform, the uh, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Foundry platform? Well, with Open Source, you can certainly do the things that we're going to show you today, um, but it's more involved. So you can create a Spring Boot app, you can add a starter, you can add the annotations that you need, the configuration, build your security model, you can deploy it somewhere, and then once you're done with that, then you have to manage all of the updates yourself. Well, what do we do with SCS? One, the first tenet of SCS is ease of use, and all it requires is to do a CF create service. And we've got those three different services. You can create a circuit breaker, you can create a config server, it's as easy as doing that. Second tenet of SCS is security. And with SCS, we have our own identity zone, a dedicated, excuse me, a dedicated identity zone within UAA, and we do OAuth to security between the applications. And this is the flow that generally um, the, the services adhere to. So the first thing that happens is you bind your app to a service, and then after you bind the app, a unique key and uh, unique ID and secret are generated. And then after that, the, those unique ID and secret are exchanged for an authorization token. And then once the app has the authorization token, it can then make requests to each individual, or whichever individual service that you're bound to. And the third tenant is reliability. And this isn't really anything that SCS specifically provides, although we do have done a lot of work to make SCS as reliable as we can. But the platform itself offers scalability and highly available uh, infrastructure for running your applications. And since SCS is running on the platform, you benefit from that. And of course, we built everything with Spring. Framework, boot, cloud, Spring Security, Spring Data, these are all the underlying projects that we use to build Spring Cloud Services. It's all the, the same trusted projects that you use in all of your applications as well, or you should be using. Uh, let's talk about the first service. That's SES Config Server. 
So what is a config server? Um, imagine you've got a thousand applications and you want to configure all of them. Um, it's very daunting to think about having to individually configure every single one of those 1,000 applications. Config server allows you to centralize the configuration and then apply that to all of those applications very seamlessly. And when you provision a config server on SCS, we deploy a, a Spring Cloud config server for you for each individual SI that is provisioned. So that means you get a dedicated config server each time you provision a new um, SI or service instance. We support Git and HashiCorp Vault as the backing stores for con config server. So if you're not familiar with config server, what this means is that you can publish your configuration in Git or you can publish your configuration in Vault. And then config server itself essentially proxies that to all of your applications so that each application can then read that configuration. For Git, we support both basic auth and SSH. And in addition, we also support uh, composition of multiple backends, or composite as my Toronto colleague likes to say. <laughs> And what do I mean by uh, composite backends? Well, here's an example. Um, you can define a vault data source. You can also define a Git data source. And config server is going to aggregate all that information for you and offer it to your application, or provide it to your application. And it's all going to be very seamless. So any configuration that's in either of those sources will then be available to your application that's bound to this config server. A uh, note about security, only bound applications can access the configuration. So you've got this config server deployed in uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but you can't have a random other application that decides that it wants to pull that configuration. So you have to have the, the bound application with the, the key and the, the authorization token to be able to access that configuration. And when you use the, the SES starters, we have our own Spring Boot starters for SES. When you use those with a client application, we automatically add these property sources to your application. So there's no additional configuration you have to do for your application to be able to consume that configuration. Uh, let's talk about SES service registry. What is service registry? Well, in the same similar way that you don't want to have to configure a thousand different applications, you also don't want to hard code routes to all of your different microservices and all of your different microservices. So service registry allows you to, it, it's conceptually similar to the way DNS works. You register an application with a service registry and then you make a request to that named application instead of to an IP address or a URL. And so it, that request then goes to the service registry and asks, where is this located? It returns the actual URL for that application. And then it's very seamless to your application. You don't have to do anything to manage this because when you include the client libraries in, in your application, Spring Cloud will automatically negotiate that uh, exchange for you. Um, in terms of what the service does on PCF, we deploy a Spring Cloud Netflix Eureka server for each provision service instance. And again, we're not, this is, we're not sharing these, these instances. It's one, you know, when you create one service instance, then you get a dedicated uh, Netflix Eureka server. And a note on security here, only the originating uh, application can create uh, only the application that originally created the registry can update or delete the registry. And so this is consider a man in the middle of attack. You don't want either a nefarious or otherwise application to be able to go delete the registry for one of your services. You only want the service who created it to be able to do that. So um, the potential there is that somebody could hijack your request to a service without your knowledge. Um, 
unlikely event because the platform provides a lot of security and et, et cetera around this, but it's just, you know, layers of security, always good. Uh, client applications automatically configure a discovery client. So again, if you include our SES starters in your application, then this is gonna be um, configured for you and it's not anything extra you have to do. So let's talk about circuit breaker. And what is a circuit breaker? Um, so you, uh, my best example that, that I've always used at least is if you use Netflix and you've got like a, a uh, recommended or favorites list that shows up at the top, um, they're going to a microservice, potentially, I, I don't know this for sure, but potentially they're going to a microservice and maybe the microservice fails and then that circuit breaker falls over to sort of a default list of favorites or something like that. So this is what circuit breaker dashboard gives you. If you annotate your uh, applications in certain ways, then you can define a fallback. The circuit breaker, that information is fed into a, a rabbit queue and then aggregated by a turbine server, server. The turbine server then streams it to the circuit breaker dashboard and then it has a nice display so that you can see the status of all of your circuit breakers. So the things that I, I just mentioned there, we deploy a Hystrix dashboard application, we deploy a Turbine server application, and then we also provision a RabbitMQ for handling the, the queuing of all of those um, uh, statuses from the circuit breakers. And again, for the client applications, if you include SES starters, then you're gonna automatically configure a Turbine AMQ client within your application. And so it's gonna know how to broadcast that information to the, the Rabbit uh, server. Okay, let's talk about the uh, client applications. I mentioned this a few times. Um, we have a set of starters that are specific for SES. These, this is nothing special or unique about what we're doing here. What we've done is we've packaged up some dependencies that you need to run these applications on Spring Cloud Services, and we've made them very easily accessible. And so these are the three that correspond to the three services. Uh, these are all open source, Apache licensed. You can go see what dependencies that we're including in these. Uh, again, not, not a big secret there. Um, largely underneath, we're including uh, what we call Spring Cloud Services connectors. And again, the connectors are also Apache license open source, so you can see how we're uh, negotiating with the platform itself to, to um, retrieve the information that we need to provide that to your applications. Uh, SES Starters 1.6 supports Boot 1.5 and Spring Cloud Edgeware. And now we have SES Starters 2.0, which supports Boot 2.0 and Spring Cloud Finchley. So these are our two latest versions. If you're building a Spring Boot 1.5 application, you would want Starters 1.6. If you're building a new Boot 2 application, then you would want to use Starters 2.0. That's pretty much simply how it is. Um, we now also support a plain text config server client. And that's been an addition to both of those versions. And I believe Ollie's gonna show us a little demo about that later. Uh, we have a published SES compatibility matrix. Um, this goes back a long way. Hopefully if you are on, I will say 1.4 or older, please talk to us about upgrading. Uh, we would really like to see everybody on, on 1.5 and 2.0 if possible. Um, the thing that I wanna note here that's, is what I, I really wanna drive home. So, the bottom four rows, you see the SES tile 1.5, 1.5, and starters 1.6 and 2.0. What this means is that you can use a boot 2 or a boot 1.5 app with either version of SES. So this is really key. We've done a lot of work to make sure that whichever version of boot you want to use in your client application will work with the last version, SES 1.5 or SES 2.0. So should be good. <laughs> if you're not, let us know. <laughs> uh, this compatibility matrix is published out on the docs Pivotal IO site. Um, 
you don't have to memorize this URL. If you know the, the doc site, then you can easily find this. Uh, and SCS starters, this is the, the GitHub repo for that. I mentioned it's, it's an OSS project. Um, connectors is also OSS. They're all on GitHub. And we've got Spring Cloud, uh, excuse me, Spring Cloud Services, Cloud Foundry, CLI plugin. It's a mouthful. Um, CLI plugin lets you interact with SCS service instances. Has anybody used a CLI plugin for PCF? Cloud Foundry, right. one or two. Uh, we have one for SCS, and this is how you install it. Not overly complicated. And here's a list of some of the, the features that we have. Uh, I don't know if this is comprehensive or not. This list might be a little outdated, but you can do things like uh, stop SCS, restart it, um, view the list of the, the services that are registered with a service registry. Um, so all, all pretty valuable. If you are authenticated via the CF CLI, then you can just utilize this plugin without having to do extra uh, authentication and negotiation stuff. It's, it's very handy. Uh, the CF CLI plugin is also Apache licensed. It's out on GitHub. So you're welcome to go look at that too. And what's new? Uh, SCS 2.0. Uh, we originally thought this was going to be a trivial upgrade, no. <laughs> uh, as you all know, I, I heard a little laughter. Um, upgrading to boot 2 is not nearly as trivial, trivial as we all thought it might be. Um, but we did it. <laughs> and uh, we've got full boot 2 support with Spring Call Finchley for all of the service broker and backing services. And Every, we're very pleased with the work that we did as a team. It, it's uh, come, worked out really well. Uh, in addition to that, we've added support for custom domains. So you can specify a, a custom domain that when apps are provisioned, that the routes that those apps use can be customized. So that's a new feature. And with that, it's time to turn over to Ali. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about where, what the future has in hold for SCS, and I have to tell you, it's pretty exciting. So uh, one of the main kind of um, underlying technical changes we're making is introducing a new component called Spring Cloud App Broker. Um, this is going to be, again, fully open source, Apache licensed. Um, what we're doing is we're basically building an abstraction so you can build your own service broker really easily and building SCS on top of that. So any new Spring applications that um, we need to turn into um, brokers and tiles. Um, App Broker is going to be a really good place to kind of build that on top of, and it means basically we can stop duplicating code between sort of common projects. Um, so config server is going. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ali. Uh, one one more thing to note about App Broker. Um, this is going to be an open source project, so it's again. I, I, Repeating myself, but this is going to be Apache license, open source, and it's out there right now, so you can see the progress that we're making on it. Um, so, yeah, Config Server is due a pretty uh, major overhaul. Um, one of the big things here is uh, integration with CredHub. So, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of CredHub. Um, if you haven't, you may well be using it without actually realizing it. And um, CredHub is really tightly integrated with Cloud Foundry. It's built from the ground up to um, support Cloud Foundry very deeply. Um, its role is to store secrets, much like HashiCorp Vault does, um, but you can just use it out, out of the box if you've got a, a Cloud Foundry install at the, at the right version. So um, our new config server will use that as a backend to store um, sort of secrets and credentials so you can use them in your applications in a sort of secure, encrypted manner. Um, a read-only cache in PCF is basically um, so you've got your upstream Git server, that could be GitHub or your own Bitbucket or something, and uh, Config Server is going to mirror those. So um, the actual Config Server will uh, talk to a mirror. Um, the main reason for this is that it means that you don't have to kind of constantly be hitting the network, um, uh, and you can basically um, have some data local to your, um, your PCF foundation. Um, and it says a slice of data sovereignty is one of those reasons where you might have certain data for GDPR reasons in certain countries. Um, so that's where the uh, foundation local mirror can, can help with that in Config Server. And 
One of the kind of big complaints we've had is that creating a config server instance, you get this um, really big kind of blob of JSON to all these different configuration settings. So we really want to improve the uh, user experience with that and build a CLI with a much um, sort of simpler um, set of defaults and ways of creating config server instances. So um, do you want to, shall I go into the demo? Um, or do you want to? Yeah, we keep turning my mic off. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention this uh, session that's coming up on Thursday, uh, T-Mobile success story about migrating to SCS. So if you want to check that out, and then I'll let Holly go into so, yeah, that. I just want to kind of show you some of the new features that you can use today in SCS2. So um, let's just roll on with that. Now, um, I just mentioned CredHub, so this is, um, I just want to show you what um, SES's current integration with CredHub looks like. So um, bear with me two secs. So I want to show you the old days um, of what a service instance environment looked like before CredHub. So if I go up to here, so you've probably seen VCAP services. So VCAP services is um, where when you create a binding from an app to a service instance, this is where um, all the kind of information that the app needs to connect to that service is. Now I'm picking on MySQL because this is MySQL v1. This has now been replaced with v2. So this is an older version of MySQL. You can see here it's got things like uh, um, username and password. This is kind of available uh, in the user space. So this was like a massive complaint um, from customers that we had this in plain text. So now I'm going to show you what the new world uh, looks like. So I just had to record these curls because they're quite long. So this is an SCS application found with our config server. And you can see here, we don't, in our VCAP services area, we actually store this CredHub reference. So um, now what happens is a cloud controller understands this and is able to um, automatically inject the, the secrets into the, into the client application. Okay, so next thing I want to um, talk about is uh, composite config. So I'm just going to show you first how you create a config, uh, composite config server. So um, this is what the JSON looks like. And you're going to see, as I was mentioning earlier, it's really quite, it's quite a big bit of JSON. So what we've got here is um, you've got two Git repositories and a Vault repository. So the idea here is that you might have like, um, maybe this is one team's config. This could be their database config. And you've got this what I call auxiliary config. So this could be another team's config. And you've also got a Vault um, repository down here. So in some cases, you might well want to merge configs between two teams and also have some secrets. So in this case, it's going to go ahead and um, pull out the config from all of these uh, different sources. And I'll quickly just show you the, the sources. So we, if I open up my browser, this is the first one. It's just a GitHub repository. It's just got some uh, YAML files in here that it's going to use uh, for its uh, property sources. And we just got like DB name and DB location. And then we've got the uh, same thing here, my auxiliary config repo, spring is awesome. And we've got WW root, uh, just another config value. And now let's just have a quick look at what's in Vault. So again, spring is awesome. And we've got our DB password in Vault. So now what I'm going to do is curl uh, at the endpoint of an app that I previously deployed. And you can see here, you've um, brought together all those uh, secrets, so your DB name, location, www root, and your DB password. So I mean, as Roy was saying earlier, in the world of microservices is really, really powerful and abstraction where you want to keep your um, secrets and your config managed well and under control, really. Um, I think I just want to quick, really quickly, I just wanted to show you how simple it is to build these, this app with um, Spring Cloud Services. So um, I'm just going to enter presentation mode quickly so it makes it a bit easier to see. So uh, yeah, literally, um, you just got for the application itself, uh, sort of really simple kind of um, 
auto wiring, um, this remote config, this is what represents um, the, the value, so the things like the DB name, DB location. And now this is that value, this is just normal spring, so where the config server is clever, it, um, it, it takes uh, the environment from a remote source, so this would work with a properties file as well, because all spring knows is it's looking for um, uh, this in its, in its environment, so this is done, done behind the scenes for you. Um, it's just a case of CF push, you create a, a Cloud Foundry manifest. In this case, um, I, I've deployed it on Bosch Lite, so I've done this all sort of locally. And, and the other thing that you need is um, when you're using Vault, is that you do need to um, have a token. So um, this is your Vault token. Now, what you could do is store this in Cred Hub, so, um, which would mean you wouldn't have to have that in, in plain text potentially. So, those options there, not having to have that sort of token um, written down like that. And then, just to show you what the kind of Gradle file looks like, we just pull in our, um, so we've got our Spring Cloud Services, Dependencies, Spring Boot, and Open Source um, Spring Cloud Finchley. Okay, so I think that is it. Any questions? Yeah. Over here. Uh, question one is, was there an order to converting as a configuration in the composite? <laughs> Good question, because um, Roy asked me that earlier. Um, <laughs> and it's the uh, late l last one. So if there's duplicate properties, the, the last one wins. Okay. Yeah. Um, it depends. I think it is kind of no at the moment. Is that right, Chris? Uh, I, the recommendation for production would be that you should increase the count to two or, or more. Um, the reason for that is if you do a uh, upgrade, let's say a PAS, and it starts moving Diego cells around, um, at least in that uh, way you can ensure that most of the time it's going to be up uh, more often. Otherwise, you will have downtime if you only have one instance. I guess the other thing, though, is you'll get, is you'll get servers itself that could be, um, that you might need to sort of balance as well. You will hit them more often. You'll hit your Git server for every uh, instance you have of your config server. You'll hit your Git server that many times because every single container does a clone. Yep. Um, I didn't hear uh, anything about Spring Cloud services with you know, Docker Swarm or Kubernetes Swarm. Um, I'm reading a lot of articles where, of course, that's in place. And, uh, yeah. Any special conditions I should be looking out for for a uh, fairly large Kubernetes swarm? So I guess you can look at the open source um, Spring Cloud projects. You know, they're all supported in a Kubernetes environment, and the Spring Cloud Kubernetes project especially is going to help upon building apps that are kind of Kubernetes native, as it were. Um, I think. I, I don't know about the future. For, the future for us. Yes, we are looking more and more into how we can build on, you know, Kubernetes. I mean, at today, most of our com our customers are still, you know, they're using Cloud Foundry. That's our main focus. But we're, you know, we've got our eye on the future and you know, where we need to be um, moving. And the same recommendation for more than one instance in product. We, we'd spin up a couple, two, three instances. Yeah, yeah. The C C CF scale is going to, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in SDS, which is really Cloud Foundry based. SES takes care of that for you with uh, one configuration option. It's actually named count. And you can put whatever number in there that you want for how many instances you want. If you do that in open source, you do have to do a little bit of work to, to make sure that you load balance across all those config server instances. But they, it's something yeah. you can do, definitely. It's supported by the open source. Yeah. Uh, we are looking at PKS in the future, obviously. And in PKS, uh, the Spring Cloud Kubernetes project, highly recommend taking a look at it. But you have Discovery Client in there. You, you're able to enable uh, config server as well. So you should be able to uh, deploy the open source on the Kubernetes today. We're going to be probably supporting Kubernetes. I, I won't make any time frame. <laughs> and because of our integration with UAA and Cred Hub, uh, we're waiting for those to become available to Kubernetes in PKS. If there's any other questions, uh, Chris is our PM for this project, and we have another engineer up here as well. So feel free to come up and talk to us after the session. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.